All right, so the title of the fourth book is the Book of Numbers, which I think that's it's really sensitive. Um, it came from both the Latin and the Greek. I think the, the, the word was arithmi, so we get the word arithmetic. So they used the Book of Numbers, and that came from the fact that in chapters 1 and chapter 26, the Lord had him take a census of all the men able to fight over the age of 20. And that was preparing them for the battles that they would face. The more appropriate title really is from the Hebrew, which means translated in the wilderness, which tells the story of them meandering and wandering for 39 years after uh, the judgment that comes. We'll talk about that in a little while and before they get to the promised land. And as we talked about last week in Leviticus, we said around 1450 B.C., so this would be around 1400, most of this activity, but it covers a period of... 39 to 40 years, and of course Moses is given credit as the author, as he is of the, all the, the first five books of the scripture. Um, and so while Leviticus, we talked about last week, the activity took place really in Sinai, right near the mountain, and, and as they constructed the tabernacle, etc. This book, the activity takes place from their leaving Sinai all the way till they get to the plains of Moab, cross the Jordan River, where they could see Jericho. All right, so it, takes, it, it covers quite a bit of territory and quite a bit of time. And, you know, throughout the time they left Egypt that first year, God had taken care of them. They had food, they had water, they had safety, um, but yet the, the people grumbled, they complained, and we'll see that. So now they're ready to depart from the Promised Land, and they have instructions for daily living. They have instructions for keeping themselves pure, for a holy God within that sacrificial system. And they have instructions on how they're going to pick up and move when, when God says with that cloud or that pillar of fire at night, when he picks up, they would pack up everything and they would go. And so the instructions are there. Um, and God said he'll be with them. Cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. But the events that take place within the book of Numbers really are, some of them are pretty shocking. Some of the judgments and some of the sins of the people are pretty shocking. And we'll look at some of those. But they serve as clear demonstrations. And really they form the thesis for the book of Numbers. And there's three key points I want you to take from this. One is the, the sinful human heart and the nature of rebellion. Number two is the long-suffering or the patience of God. And number three is the painful reality of judgment against rebellion. All right? Those are three key points you want to take from the book of Numbers. And the key thing, too, to keep in mind is despite all this, all this activity, all this uh, sin and all this rebellion, that God will bring his promises to pass. Right? Nothing's going to thwart that. And so the easiest way, if we look to outline this, there's really two sections you want to look at. One we would call the old generation. From the first census in chapter 1 through chapter 25, we would call that the old generation. I'll explain that in a little while. And then from 26 to the end, which is chapter 36, we would call the, the prospects of the new generation to enter the promised land. Okay, so let's look at some of the activity then, the major events that occurred, and we'll keep coming back and looking at those three key points because it's a recurrent theme, the sin and rebellion of the people, the long-suffering or the patience of God, and then the painful judgment that comes against that rebellion. So the first 10 chapters pretty much deal with the census, first of all, uh, the activity of the Levites, if you remember, the tabernacle was situated such that there were three tribes on each quadrant, north, south, east, and west. And the Levites, uh, who weren't going to actually get land in the, in the promised land, were divided up amongst those tribes. And they were the ones in charge of the tabernacle. No one else could, and they came to pack up. They were the ones who, they each had specific things they were in charge of. The articles of worship, the curtains, the 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 candle, the, whatever it was, they were the ones who would pack up, carry it to the next place, and set up. And no one else was able to touch that. And so we get to the end of chapter 10, and they're finally ready to move out of Sinai. God picks up and takes off. And what happens in chapter 11? Grumbling and complaining begins. Right off the bat, complaining about, you know, they said, Moses, you brought us out into the wilderness to die. We had food, we had plenty of... Uh, to drink and plenty of food back in Egypt, all oh, that we could go back to Egypt. And then Moses goes and intercedes for the people. Chapter 12. I'm going to go through some of these just to show you this recurrent theme. Chapter 12, 
the brother and sister of Moses, Aaron and Miriam, complain against him, against their brother. And the Lord comes down this time. If you remember, Miriam actually was given leprosy. And for a week, she was unclean, could not come into the camp. Uh, God just, as a warning, she became leprous. Chapter 13 is a very key event. The Lord told Moses to send 12 men into the promised land to spy it out, one from each tribe. And we had that story where these 12 men, they spent 40 days spying out this wilderness, this land of Canaan, the land of milk and honey. And at the end of 40 days, they all come back. Ten of them give a report. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a beautiful land. It's an abundant land. But man, there are giants there. And we can't begin to go up against those guys. There's like, they, we look like grasshoppers in their eyes. But two men, Joshua and Caleb, said, no, it's a, it's a good land. And there are giants there. But the Lord has already told us we can take that land. Let's go do it. But it's ten against two. And so those ten fomented this uh, rebellion against all the people. And in chapter 14, then, we have the key point, really, in the, in the book. And that is, and most of you have probably heard the term, slow as Moses. Everybody's heard that term, right? It was not Moses that was slow. It was Moses who was being obedient to God's command. Because what happened was, because of those people complaining and grumbling, and those ten men who brought against um, the rest of the Israelites this rebellious attitude, the Lord said, all right, you complained about bodies dying in the waters. That's exactly what's going to happen. And so the Lord pronounced judgment that for the next 39 years, for 40 years total, they would wander. And anybody over the age of 20 would not enter into the promised land. One year for every day the spies had been in spying out the land. Okay, So 40 years of judgment. The old generation would not enter into the promised land. And immediately, too, those ten spies died of a plague. As soon as God pronounced that, those other ten men died of a plague. So we look here. Um, I'll read for you here in chapters, chapter 14, verses 26. It says, The Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, How long shall this wicked congregation grumble against me? I have heard the grumblings of the people of Israel, which they grumble against me. That's a popular word in this book. Say to them, as I live, declares the Lord, what you have done in my hearing, I will do to you. Your dead bodies shall fall in the wilderness, and all of your number, listed in the census, from 20 years old and upward, who have grumbled against me, not one shall come into the land where I swore that I would make you dwell, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. And that's what came to pass. And then it says, over in verse 36 of chapter 14, and the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land, who returned and made all the congregation grumble against him by bringing up a bad report about the land. The men who brought up the bad report died by plague before the Lord, except for Joshua and Caleb. That's a very key point then in the book. Again, come back to those, those themes. The, the sinful heart, the rebellious heart, the grumbling, complaining. God is long-suffering to a point. And it says he reaches a point where enough is enough, and then there's a painful judgment that comes for that. And then we see, if we take this like and look at Psalm 95, and it's quoted then in the book of Hebrews. So this gives a little glimpse looking forward. In the book of Hebrews chapter 3, the author of Hebrews comes to this point, and he, he quotes Psalm 95 about this instance. He said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart as in a rebellion. On the days of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test, and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore I was provoked at the generation and said, They always go astray in their heart, and they have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And so the author of Hebrews is looking at something more than just the promised land, looking to an eternal home. But he brings up that point to say, God in his judgment, that there's a, there's a rest available for the people of God. All right? Another thing that happens, chapter 16, is a very interesting account of more rebellion and judgment that comes. And that is a man named Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. They basically set up a coup. They bring 250 men with them, and they're going to go against the Lord. They, they're challenging Moses' authority. And so basically, I don't want to go into detail, but they set up this account where Moses basically says, you know, if, if, if these men who are here challenging me today, if they die in a natural way, if they die the way that men usually die, then I'm not to be in charge. The Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord does something new and different, 
if he opens up the earth and swallows these men and, and their families and everything they own and takes them alive into Sheol, the place of the dead, then you will know that I am the leader. And immediately they said that, that's exactly what happened. Korah's rebellion was met by the Lord, and they were, the earth opened up, however you want to, it was an earthquake, we don't know, but, it, but it's reported that they were taken, up, taken alive, yeah, taken alive down into Sheol. And this did not go well for Korah and his friends. All right? Again, sin of rebellion. The sin of not trusting the Lord. God is patient to a point, and then, you know, there's enough. And then comes the painful rebellion. Certainly that was painful. Believe it or not, there's more grumbling in chapter 20. This one affects Moses, their leader. He was so disgusted. And God said, you know, they're grumbling about water. Take them here. Strike this rock. The water will come. And we know in the New Testament that is looked at as Christ being that rock, the one who, who gave them drink. But Moses in his anger struck the rock twice, and God said, okay, you've disobeyed me in front of the whole nation of Israel, so now you will not enter the promised land. And so the tough judgment that comes, and we know that he's forbidden to enter because of, that's at Meribah, that's mentioned in Psalm 95, um, the grumbling and complaining and the rebellion at Meribah. Right? So you see this pattern repeated again and again. And then a very inter interesting story in chapter 21, as we just go move these briefly. The people are complaining. This time the Lord sent in fiery serpents, poisonous snakes, in and amongst the camp of the Israelites. And they were biting the Israelites, and they were dying. And the people come to Moses and say, Lord, or go to the Lord, please, for us, and have him take these serpents away. And Moses goes and intercedes for the people, as he did again and again and again. And the Lord did not take away the serpents, but he gave them a way out. And he said, if you will construct a pole and put on it a snake made of bronze and hold it up in the air, and when someone who's bitten looks at that, they can live. Right? That's exactly what happened. Fast forward to chapter 3 of John's gospel, in this conversation with Nicodemus, a Pharisee who knew this story very well. And Jesus said, just as the serpent was lifted up in the wilderness... As Moses lifted up that serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that all who look on him will have eternal life. And so we get that glimpse of God's plan of redemption that comes through Christ and this man, Nicodemus, a Pharisee who knew that story very well. And things begin to turn even in his own mind, in his own heart. And we see a little glimpses of Christ. As sinful human would have it, the Israelites then began to worship that snake. And under King Hezekiah, the Snake had to be destroyed because it became an idol to God's people. That's in 2 Kings. So on and on and on we see this again and again. And then one of the most crazy stories in all Scripture happens in chapters 22 and 24. And it deals with Balaam, a pagan prophet, and a talking donkey. Again, ba Balak was the king of Moab, and as the Israelites had made their way, to his territory across the Jordan River. They're on the plains of Moab, and this king sees this throng of people. He knew God had been with them, and so he summons this pagan prophet to come and curse these Israelites. And Balaam um, says, you know, I can only do what the Lord tells me to do. And he wasn't going to go, and then finally he went, and he was riding his donkey. If you remember that story, the, the donkey sees the, this flaming sword and its angel who was going to a to kill him, and he ends up striking the donkey. He said, how come you lay down? How come you push me against this? He says, open his eyes and let him see. The donkey had actually saved him, but the, the Lord made this donkey to talk. And then Balaam then was only able to go when Balak took him to different places to look at the Israelites. Instead of cursing them, all he can do is pronounce a blessing over them. Balaam did some other wicked things. He ends up getting whacked later on. But that is a story of God using a pagan prophet for his purposes, to bless his people. Right, so we see the theme again and again of grumbling, complaining. And we come to chapter 26, and this is the key point. The old generation now is gone. Beginning in chapter 26, a census of the new generation. All the men over the age of 20, able to fight, because they're going to enter the land, they're going to have some battles. And so chapter 26 then is the key turning point then as they, the new generation now is going to enter the promised land. The last 10 chapters or so uh, deal with a lot of 
housekeeping, so to speak. Um, there's a couple of key points I wanted to point out in those last 10 chapters from 27 to 36. Leadership now is being passed from Moses to Joshua. Moses has been forbidden to enter the land, so now Joshua is going to be the leader. And we see the book after Deuteronomy is, is the book of Joshua and their conquest in going into the Promised Land. We see uh, final instructions about the conquest and how land's going to be uh, inherited, so forth, and how the land will be divvied up. That comes later in, in the book of Joshua. We see final instructions um, for the allocation of the land east of the Jordan. If you're studying this, uh, the Jordan River is, the, is the, the divide between Israel and then what, what is now Jordan. And the tribes of Reuben and Gad and half the tribe of Manasseh set up on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Um, and then one of the key things, too, is they set up cities of refuge. And what that is simply for, for manslaughter. If there was someone who had accidentally done something that resulted in someone else's death, they could flee to one of these cities. There were six of them. And they would be held safe until they could have a trial. All right, that would prevent vigilante justice. And uh, so God appropriated for that. Not for murder. This is for manslaughter. Okay. And then chapter 33 kind of gives a summary of Israel's journey from Egypt to Canaan. So that's kind of the activity that occurs. But what you see again, if you look at those three key points, continual grumbling, complaining against what God had promised. All right? And that's kind of our nature, right? We grumble, complain when things don't go our way. And we kind of point a finger to Israelites, but what would we do? Would we be in the same boat? And then we see the, the, the long-suffering of God, His patience to put up with this kind of thing to a certain point. And then... Again, judgment is meted out against that rebellion, and it's, it's a painful, it's a, it's a judgment that is, uh, you know, you look at the snakes, you look at Korah, you look at those things that occurred, and God's judgment is final and complete. They all had opportunities, but he says enough is enough. And I want to read, uh, as we close this up, look at uh, what one of the commentaries said about this. It says, God is certainly faithful to protect and preserve his people and in this book, we've seen several instances of sin and rebellion. In spite of this rebellion, the faithful and gracious God continued to guide and sustain His servant nation. Although Israel's rebellion impacted which generation enjoyed the covenant blessings, the ultimate fulfillment of those blessings rests solely on God's unchanging character alone. So it was up to God. And we go back and we looked at Genesis, chapter 12 of Genesis, the call to Abram. He said, what? I will make you a great nation and you will be great. He says, I will bless those who bless you, and those who curse you I will curse. And then through you, through your line, through your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed, looking at Christ. And so we see this transpiring here. And I like to go, anytime you, you, you go into an Old Testament book and you can see glimpses of what was coming, and we see like the serpent being lifted up, a promise of Christ on the cross. Um, and I just find it very comforting to know that God's word has never changed. He's a faithful God. He's a long-suffering God. Praise the Lord for that. And uh, if anybody had any other questions or comments.